Exotic sports cars have always been known for their amazing sounds as they speed past you, their beautiful designs, and their high price tags, especially in the world of Italian automobiles. However, the De Tommaso Pantera found a way to bridge the gap between the gorgeous design of the ever-desirable Italian exotics and the affordability and power of the American muscle cars. The Pantera can keep up with powerful and sleek Ferraris or Maseratis of the 70s while costing about half as much. In fact, it broke the mold as the first affordable mid-engine exotic. Alejandro de Tommaso founded the company and moved to Italy in order to create these gorgeous cars. And he started with the Mangusta, which also had the Ford engine in it. And then he upped the game with the Pantera. So initially, he actually approached Iacocca in order to try and form the merger between the two companies. And so Lee Iacocca agreed to the idea and they presented it to Henry Ford. And he really liked the idea as well because at that time, Ford really wanted a sleek and sexy sports car to add to their mix of cars that they were selling. For Henry Ford, it was also a little personal to him. After the merger between Ferrari and Ford fell flat in 1963, Henry Ford really wanted something to kind of show them up. So when the idea of adding the Pantera to the mix came along, he thought it was a great idea. So Ford took care of the distribution in America, in the US, and then De Tommaso's factory handled the distribution elsewhere in the world. The Pantera was actually assembled in Italy. And people may think that because it is powered by a Ford engine, it would have been assembled here. These cars in the very beginning, they had a couple little issues. One of the big ones was overheating. So, and the cockpit would get very hot. But what a lot of people have done is in early cars, they would replace the radiator. And it's such a known problem that there's actually companies such as Pantera Performance who make the big aluminum radiators to replace. This one has one of those big aluminum radiators and a few other modifications we'll talk about. And even if you buy a Pantera that hasn't had that replaced, which most have by now because they're easily accessible parts and not that expensive, but if you have one with the original radiator, then parts are really easy to find. Having dealt with Ferraris my whole life, I'm used to parts being astronomical prices. So I love the affordability factor and of course the performance of the Pantera. I've always loved how spacious the engine bay is on the Pantera. It just makes them a lot easier to work on compared to a lot of the tight squeezed engines in the Italian, you know, the Ferraris that I usually work with. This car, it has the trunk insert and it's great because you can fit a lot of luggage in here, your overnight bags, so you can go on a road trip and you and your wife can both have your bags and not be struggling for space. But what I thought was a great design is this whole insert actually comes comes out really easily. So you just lift it up and pull it out of the car and it's not super heavy or anything. And then you have access to the entire engine bay. So once it's out, you can easily access anything in here. And the Pantera originally has the V8 engine that produces about 310 horsepower. However, this car has been slightly modified. So this one has the 351 stroker engine in it, and it actually also has electronic fuel injection, which they did not have when new. So that, along with some other modifications, allows this car to produce around 450 horsepower. It's just awesome. More power is never really a bad thing. So you can pretty much burn rubber in any gear in this car. And so it takes an already amazing car, just gives it that little something extra. 
You can't add the extra bump in horsepower and not make any other modifications. So when you're adding about 140 extra horsepower to a car, you're going to need other things like wider tires to make sure it sticks to the ground. So this car has the steel fender flares and sometimes when cars are, have flares added, they do fiberglass because it's cheap and easy, but this one has the steel flares and it has 345 wide tires on the rear. So you you get that extra sticking power to help with that extra horsepower so you can actually use it because if you're not sticking to the ground then you're not going anywhere and then this car also has the sunroof so basically these cars would have been built in Italy with the standard options and then when it was delivered new to the dealer the dealer would have installed the sunroof which is why little add-ons like that are called dealer installed and not factory original so it's original to the car, but done by the dealer before it was delivered to its new owner. Now this car also has the flush mounted windshield, which was done much later on, but I like the look of it. It gives it a very sleek kind of look. Uh, and with this car, we have what's called a Marty report, which is basically the printout of everything, how this car was delivered new, all the options, how many were produced in that year, the colors, everything like that. I love it because it's a couple hundred bucks for a Marty report. And if you were to try and get the same thing from Ferrari, which they have, it's called the Ferrari Classic K, you're looking at five, 10, $15,000 for the same kind of basic option list, just in a fancy booklet form. So that's what I mean when I say that the Pantera is the perfect mix of the Italian styling, the performance and the affordability. The Pantera is kind of known for not fitting taller people. If you're above about six feet tall, you probably won't fit in your average Pantera. However, the owner of the previous owner of this car was a bit taller and always wanted a Pantera. So he had the floor pans under the seats lowered by two inches. So you have that extra headroom. So if you wanted a Pantera, but you're a little, little too tall for it, this car might actually fit you. Then a couple of the other modifications. So this car does have the roll cage and the fire suppression system and the fuel cell in the back. So a fuel cell basically is filled with foam. That way it's safer. It's designed different for racetracks. If there's an accident, you don't get the gas leaking and it won't cause a fire. So having these modifications, you could still drive this car on the street, but it's one of those cars where you can drive it to the racetrack, race it around and then drive it home, which is one of my personal favorite kind of cars because having driven a lot of race cars, racing is amazing, but the ease of being able to drive to the track and then drive home versus having to take a trailer and lots of spares and lots of stuff, it just makes it a lot easier. <laughs> A lot of things impacted the cars of the early 70s, and one of those was the gas crisis in 73 and 74. And that really had an impact, especially on cars like the Pantera, who do tend to suck a lot of gas. But another thing that really impacted the 70s cars was new EPA and DOT laws. So the EPA made really heavy smog restrictions, and then the DOT required a lot of different bumper regulations. So as you can see between these two cars, this car is a later car. It's a 74 L model. And we have a whole video on this Pantera if you want to watch it. But as you can see, the big difference is the bumper. And this was because of the DOT regulations. They had to install these in order to conform and still sell these cars in the US. And this one is a 72. So you can see on the front, it has the two little tiny bumpers. And that was how they were originally made. And the front bumpers on this one are definitely not as good for impact protection, but they have a very sleek design. So I'm personally not super opposed to the L model with the rubber bumpers. It integrates fairly nicely into the car but the early 72 cars like this are some of the most desirable because of the smaller bumpers on them. In fact, the 72 Pantera has always been a dream car of mine and I've wanted one for a while. 
Uh, sadly, I probably won't be keeping this one because I have enough cars at the moment and last thing I need to do is buy another one, but this has definitely been on my hit list for a while and if I could, I would definitely keep this one. The Pantera may not have the overly complicated overhead camshaft V12 of the Ferraris, but in 1965, a V8 Shelby Cobra beat Ferrari for the world championship anyways, and it was not nearly as complicated or expensive to maintain, which I definitely consider a win in my books. So I hope you guys have learned a little something about the De Tomaso Pantera. If you like this video, then please subscribe and stay tuned because we got a lot more coming very soon. Soon.